Welcome to With You Every Step, the solo travel podcast that explores, explains, and hopefully inspires you to travel the world by yourself. I'm your host, Michelle Lee. Welcome back to With You Every Step. Today, I have a female pilot on. Yes! I'm so excited. I have Julie Thiel here. She's a US airline pilot, and it is very exciting to talk to her. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I feel very special being your first female pilot on the show. So this is wonderful for me. Oh, I'm very excited to talk to you because I think as I was talking to Jay in my episode with Jay a few episodes back now, we were talking about female pilots. And I happened to mention that I don't know if I've ever been on a plane where I've heard the voiceover come over and it's been a female pilot. And he said, oh, yeah, when it happens, people get really excited. I said, I would. I would probably start clapping and be like, yes. (laughs) So I haven't actually experienced it. So I was really excited to talk to you. That is true what Jay is saying when when I do get over. I'm actually a captain, so I sit in the left seat. I've been a captain so going on my fifth year with Best Carrier that I work for, flying Boeing 737s. And it's always interesting to me, having been a female in this industry since 1987, that's when I started flying, to see the excitement. And there isn't a lot of, of doubt or nervousness or anything, but that how many people haven't experienced a, a female in the flight deck. I think in the U.S. we had, there's about 5% of us be going on 6%. So it's not a big number at all, but it's interesting because we as gals in the industry, we know everybody. And so we don't look at it as the, the far and few in between. So, but people do clap and they come up and they want pictures taken. So sometimes we feel very celebrity-like. Yeah, so you should. It's great. Why do you think that there's not many females in that position? It it is definitely changing. And I'm part of uh, Women International Aviation. We call it Women of Aviation. But I'm part of a group. There's There's a couple groups out there. And we did a study back in the early 90s on the percentage of the women in the industry. And and it's interesting because 15, 20 years later, that percentage really has not changed very significantly at all. But you do see a lot more of the women out there flying. And so more women are doing it. We don't stay like the men do, I want to say. A lot of gals will get into the industry and decide that they want to raise a family. Yeah. Have children and they'll kind of back their career off and then retire early instead of continuing on to age 60, 65, which is what you can retire at now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because women, obviously, having a family, you can't have a newborn baby and then go and fly for, you know, be away for two, three days while you're breastfeeding. It's, yeah, it makes a lot of sense when you put it out like that. Yeah, it it makes it harder for a lot of the women. And then there's those of us who can go out and, you know, we have great partners at home and you can switch the schedules off and do all that. And, you know, people with the grandparents and, but it is hard the first five years for most women that do want to raise families to hop back on the road and be gone for as, as much time as we are. It's even more difficult for those women who are the international, you know, work for international carriers and are gone maybe two weeks at a time, and then they'll get their two weeks off. You know, my schedule, because I fly mostly U.S. domestic, I'm gone for maybe four days at the most, and then I can come home for four days. So my schedule works out a little bit differently. Also, no kids in the house anymore either. So that that makes a big difference, you know, just having my husband and I. But, you know, I mean, I think that's the the main reason we don't see a lot of women out there. I don't think a lot of women thought that they could do it. And then you realize that we are really good multitaskers and we're really good at flying airplanes and gals can do anything a guy can do for the most part. So Mm. So what made you want to do it when you first started? What was the push? It's funny you ask. So I started when I was in high school. I grew up in Michigan, which is the, we call it the Midwest here in the 48 contiguous United States. So I grew up in Michigan and my parents were educators. They wanted me to go to school. I was actually an artist and in the drama club. So I always wanted to do something with art, with acting and all that. Scholarship to go to Kendall University in Chicago, and I declined the scholarship my senior year of high school, and um, decided to follow my best friend to a engineering school in the state of Michigan instead of branching out. And what I was getting the scholarship for was painting and sculpting more than 
you know, the stage presence. Okay. And I didn't think I could make very much money doing that. So I thought I would go and try something different. So I ended up going to an engineering school and de- like I said, declined the whole art scholarship and went into electrical engineering. I have no idea why. I just thought that sounded really exciting and cool and next to impossible. It's, it was a very hard uh, road to go down, but I stuck with it. And through my five years at university, I ended up branching off into the aviation career. It was never a passion or anything I even knew about. And to be honest with you, I'd never been in an airplane until I went to college and took my first flying lesson. Counselors at the university kind of took me down that path and said, you know, you you say you like to travel because we we traveled in a Volkswagen van with my parents and we went camping, traveled all over the United States to all the national parks and uh, which was wonderful times. And they said, you know, maybe you, you want to try being a pilot and travel more. You can get places faster in an airplane. And I just kind of went, OK, well, how do you do that? Wow. <laughs> what a change from wanting to be a creative <laughs> Absolutely. I went from this very creative, curly mindset to going into this very linear, I'm going to be an engineer and I'm going to become a pilot. So I feel fortunate that my brain allowed me to to do this. And I feel I'm, I'm very good at it. I, I struggled with the flying lessons only because I did, I got motion sickness. It was interesting. My first flying lessons going, yeah, this is not for me. It was like being in a boat. Yeah, I get really sick. How did you overcome that? Well, it, it's funny because the car sickness and being on boats, I still have trouble with both of those. Roller coasters, I managed to, um, well, I don't really do roller coasters anymore. I'm 49 going on 50, so I'm oh, I'm totally over the, the roller coaster type rides. It just, it hit me one day. I, I will say most students start in aviation and start with private pilot certification. It's It's a minimum of 40 hours in the United States by the FAA. And most students will get their life about 40 to 60 hours. It took me 98 hours because of the motion sickness. And it just, wow. it just went away one day. I don't, I could tell went you away. when, but one, one day it just went away. And I think it was because I started to understand the physics of flying and I was able to concentrate on the flying versus concentrating on how awful I felt. Yeah. <laughs> so, Yeah. That's so interesting. I find when it takes over, you just can't think of anything else because you feel so sick. Oh, you feel so terrible. I mean, I tell you what, I still love going out on fishing boats. We have a place up in the state of Alaska and my husband and I, we will go fishing and I have to fight my way through, you know, three or four boat rides and that sickness won't go away. And I tell you what, it does. It orders everything. But if I, I realized at some point the flying, I, I went back and forth the first two years of university with the flying. I was like, yes, I don't think it's for me. I, I'm really struggling with the motion. And once I figured out that every time I would kind of change class, go and do something else, like I went in and got my mechanics license. So my aviation mechanics license, which we call an A&P, and that's airframe and power plant. I got that, but realized I don't really want to be a mechanic. I want to fly. That's the fun part is being up there and being able to stare out a window and have this beautiful view and you're in control of an airplane. You're up there with the birds. I'm like, how this is the art of aviation is mm. flying the airplane. So I think when I realized that flying is really what I wanted to do, I just, I somehow had to, you know, pray and mentally get over the fact that I was motion sick. And yeah, so it just doesn't happen anymore. And I feel very fortunate because it is a, an amazing career. I'll tell you what, it's just amazing. So when you were training, they're in the very small planes though, aren't they? Yes, um, within the Cessna 150, which is just a little two-seater high-wing airplane. Yeah, so those ones, you get a lot of mo- uh, more motion sickness in those small ones compared to obviously the big ones that you're flying now. Yes, absolutely. Yes, you feel every little bump out there. <laughs> yeah, I did one ones. over the Nazca lines a few months back, and I was I took t- I had taken some motion sickness tablets, thinking that it sure. might affect me, and it still affected me. They, they didn't work. Oh, it was yeah, that yeah. bad. <laughs> so I can't imagine how that happens, and then you get over it. Yeah, I. You know, it's funny. I talked with multiple people in my industry, my career, and 
a lot of them, I, I don't couldn't even tell you the percentage, but a lot more folks that I talked to that are pilots at some point in their career when they first started had the same issues. Mine lasted a little bit longer than most. And I think it's just, you know, like what you experienced, that little tiny airplane is just so vulnerable to every air pocket that's out there. And it's just a feeling of, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a whole different feeling up there. I overcame it and I'm so glad I did. <laughs> yeah. So when you actually training, how much is is actual exam over the actual flying? Well, every rating that a pilot goes out to get, you can get a recreational pilot's license and there is a test for that. So there's always, boy, I don't know if they've changed them, but they were, it was 3,000 questions and it would be a hundred question exam. And, you know, you get a book with all of the questions and answers in it and you just study that. So the private pilot certificate, you had to take a hundred question exam the instrument rating, the commercial rating, and then to, um, if you want to be a, an instructor, so you could do a CFI, you could do what we call the certified flight instructor instrument, you can do the certified instructor multi-engine. So each one of those ratings you get up to your airline transport pilot certification requires a written test. And even when you go and you interview for your airline job, there is still a written test you have to pass for that specific aircraft that you'll be flying for that airline. So every year we take another quote unquote written exam yearly. We're always in school. We're always studying. So there is a lot of paperwork. Goodness for iPads and tablets and computers because it all can be pushed to us on those now. We don't have to worry about going out and buying books and doing it that way. So, but yeah, there is annual, annual exams even to this day. So in fact, I go back in March, I'll go in and do my exam again, you know, an oral written exam along with simulator training. So I was just about to ask about the simulator training. I was going to say, is that part of it? Yeah. With the company I work for, you know, the Boeing 737, we actually have full motion flight simulators. And I'll tell you what, those are the things that make you motion sick because it's not a real airplane, but it sure looks like it on the screens. But boy, the motion in those is like being at a ride in Universal Studios or something. It can really get going. We do three days of training annually. and We go in, spend six hours a day, three days in the simulator, practicing emergency situations, learning about some of the new airports we're going to. And we, we go in and we learn how to make it a better experience for everybody in the aviation industry, whether you are a pilot in Australia or you're a pilot in the United States or a you know, um, Japan, it doesn't matter. We're all going in and, and simulating scenarios to make aviation safer. So that's what we're doing inside the simulators. It's exhausting, mentally exhausting, because we're doing so many emergency procedures in those three days for that six hours a day. I was just about to ask, how many hours are, are you in there straight for? Yeah, we'll do about three hours and take a break, and then we'll go back in for another three hours. And then at the end of that, we talk about things we could improve on, things we have questions on. If we decide that we need a little more training in something that we didn't feel super awesome about, we can go back in and do it a little bit more. So, but it's it's about three hours, and then you get a basically a, a lunch break, you know, thirty minute break, and then we go back in. You're pretty tired when you get out of these simulator events, but you feel really good about your capability of taking 200 people up in an airplane. So it's exactly like what it is when you hop in the cockpit? Yeah, absolutely. You you hop into a simulator and it looks just like the cockpit of the Boeing 737 or whatever airplane it is that you're flying. So it's all the same stuff. It's actually incredible technology. It's phenomenal. And Google Earth actually does all of the visual displays inside. So we're moving. It looks like you're moving around and everything. You'll see cars going by. You'll see birds. Flying. There'll be people on the ground. So there'll be the buildings. And so the actually came in and did the visuals for our simulators. And it looks just like the city. It looks just like the airport. It looks just like the tree that you fly over every time you go land in Los Angeles. I mean, it's, it's incredible. If you ever get a chance to go and I recommend it to anybody, if you have some money, you can go to you know, different companies like Flight Safety and you can, you know, buy an hour or two if you have the money to do it. It's totally worth it. Now, what happens if you crash on these simulators? You know, it very rare does that happen because we don't do that in real life. So we will do everything to keep an airplane, keep the, the simulator upright. So there is no giving up. If you're struggling at 
something, you know, you're just having one of those days where things aren't super awesome and you keep doing it over and over again, you're just getting frustrated and tired. The instructors will actually stop the simulator and let you take a deep breath and start over. So if you do, let's say you're messing around and you do make a hard landing, I don't really like to use the word crash, but you do something like that. It simulates a big bump in the road and it kind of blacks the screen out. So there isn't, it's, okay. it's very difficult to yeah. do. Yeah, see, my, my game brain is like, I would just want to crash it just for the sake of it and just see what happens. Right, <laughs> right, right. But obviously this is your well, you job know, and this is very important. So you wouldn't be doing that. Right. So if you are playing, it would probably be, you know, the thing with these motion simulators, they're very, very expensive and they're very sensitive. So everything you do is simulate what the actual aircraft would do. So you really don't want to do a whole bunch of weird things to it because it will knock the simulator out of what it knows to do. You know, I know some of the older ones when I first got hired, a couple of the, the new hires that were in my class were in their simulator and they did do something that caused the simulator, the simulator itself to actually quote unquote crash and it knocked it out of it, its hydraulics. And so the simulator was down for a few hours while they tried to fix it. <laughs> But it didn't catch on fire or anything crazy like that. Oh, but we no. always laugh at them. Like, how do you guys manage that? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we don't We don't actually, I'd have to say, I don't really know what would happen if you did. Surely they would lose their job, right? Are you, you know, you, um, you would train to proficiency at that point. And if you keep doing it, then you might be talked to, of course. You know? Yeah. But we're all perfectionists, and so we all want to be better than the last guy that the instructor saw. So it's always a competition to be the ace of the base. So we all go in there, and we, we're very, very hard on ourselves, but everybody does a really good job. In the training process, I'm assuming that there wouldn't have been many women going through the same process. You know, no, at our company, we have, oh my gosh, we just acquired another airline. So we're around 3,000 pilots total at the airline that I work for. And with that being said, there's still right around 5% are women at my company. So we actually have a higher percentage of women because we have less pilots total. But if you get into some of the bigger air carriers that have 10,000 pilots, they're still right around that three to 5%, but a lot less of them are going through their training process at theirs. You know, we have, you know, a few hundred women that, that go through the training, about half and half captains and first officers. So when you went through, though, was there any other females going through with you or were you the only female? As a matter of fact, yes. So my class, I got hired in 2002. I was the second class after the 9-11 incident here in the United States. Mm -hmm. It was just a huge success and privilege to have gotten hired by an airline at that time. I was one of 12 people in my class. And there was one other gal. She was a military. I was civilian. So I went through the civilian road of training. You can, you know, you can go into the military and do it that way. I decided not to do military. But one of the gals in my class, she was a military pilot in the Air Force. Then she flew on um, the C-5, the really big transport category aircraft. So she and I were in class together. And then there was a gal, we called her plus one. So she came in and she made our class 13. She had taken, she's one of those women that decided to go out and raise her family for six years. So she took a leave of absence and came back after all of her kids were in school. So there was actually in my class of 13, the three of us were women. Fabulous. Yeah. And the one gal, the military girl, she decided after a year or two, the airline industry wasn't for her. And she went back and um, did some desk work in the military. And the other gal that um, came back from her, basically her family leave, she and I are still here with the company together. So it's always fun to see her. But yeah, I hope that answers your question on that. Some classes don't have any women at all. And some of them have, you know, two or three, but usually the classes are anywhere from 10 to 15 pilots in a class. Every few classes will have a couple females in them. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking more about if you are the only female, how the men treat you. Do they treat you like you're special because you are the only female or do they not like it so much? Great question. It gets asked a lot. So when I first started taking the flying lessons, there was a generation, you know, we called it the World War II generation of pilots. So there were a lot fewer women in the industry. And, you know, it was different because it, it was still, 
that day and age where women were supposed to be at home, the man was the one that would go out and work and she would raise the farm and the family and the cooking and, you know, do all that stuff, you know? So when I first started, yeah, there was a lot more being picked on as a gal, but it never bothered me so much because I have thick skin. So I just kind of looked past all that and went, you know, I'm not the first one to do this. This path has been paved. And there were some really brave women that came up to the the woodwork and said, I'm going to go do this and be a pilot. So yeah, I heard, I heard things going through school from older men, you know, that were my professors that would say, if women were meant to fly, the skies would be pink. Oh. Um, you know, things like that. And I just was like, how weird would say that that was just kind of that generation. Now, as I graduated from university and branched off into airline jobs, I bumped into a few interesting people out there. I tried to go get a job as a corporate pilot flying the rich and famous out of Van Nuys, California. And the person that owned that company, I knocked on the door. You know, This was back when job advertisements were in the newspaper and the classified sections and said, pilot wanted. So I went and knocked on the door of the the hangar at the Van Nuys airport and he came out and he goes, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I'm here to, here's my resume. I'm here for the job. And he basically said to me, oh, get out of here. I don't hire women. (gasps) So that was one of those things. And I tell that story today and a lot of human resources folks that are in the inclusion and diversity side of things say, you should go back and tell that guy, look at me now. And I said, well, this is my attitude on it. I'm not even going to give him the time of day because he actually bettered my career because I didn't have to work for a jerk like him. I went out and pursued a whole different career and ended up flying cargo and became a better pilot than I would have been had I been flying with him, tippy-toeing on eggshells the whole time because the guy was a jerk. So Yeah, and putting you down and making you feel like you weren't good enough and who knows, you might have ended up quitting and not going into what you're doing now. Absolutely. So I kind of look at some of these kind of crotchety old men that had an attitude about women flying, I look at them and go, that's their demon, not mine. And they actually made me a stronger person to go out there and go, well, I can do this and I can do it just as good as you can. So I think it made me work and thrive harder to be a really good pilot. Mm. And I'll tell you what, today, I don't encounter any of that. When I got hired in 2002, nobody treated me any different for being a female. And I try and explain that to a lot of people who are, again, in the inclusion and diversity side of things. And, you know, they're like, well, doesn't it make you mad when they call you a flight attendant? And I said, no, I'm actually happy about that because that means I have a personality. So I'm I'm like, that doesn't bother me at all because... I know I'm not a flight attendant, but I think that I know what my position is and I and I know what I'm good at. So I just look at that as a compliment on the side of a person that just doesn't know anything about aviation. I try and explain that a pilot is a pilot. If you're a good pilot, you can put us all in blue man suits. We can all, five of us can go in. Somebody can be, I, it could be me. It could be my Air Force husband. It could be an uh, African-American woman and it could be uh, an Asian man and we could all go in and fly the airplane good and they're going to go, I'm going to hire that one and that one. And then we take off our blue man suits and they're going to go, oh, wow, look, that person is that person's that would have never known because we can all do the same job really well. So I kind of look at it all and go, if you're good at it and you don't worry about your gender or your race or anything, I think you're going to be just fine in in really whatever you do. But yeah, no, I haven't had any problems since I got hired in, you know, being a woman. I've never felt that I've been put on distanced from anybody in that. Great. It's sad that there are still currently men today that can still treat women like that. But I think that this Me Too movement has made a really big push and show men that we're not going to put up with it anymore. And unfortunately, like you said, back in those days, you kind of just had to shrug it off and just go, yeah, all right, well, this is what I'm going to have to cope with. I'm just going to have to put myself in a bubble. I'm going to have to protect myself and I'm going to get through it. Where now we've decided that, you know what, we've had enough and we're not putting up with it and it's not acceptable anymore. Right. So, yeah, so I just go in and I, I'm going to do my job just as good as everybody else. And if I'm not doing it good for some reason, then I'll figure out how to do it better and, and bring myself back up to the, the level that I want to be at. So it's, it is definitely interesting. There's, there's a lot of interesting things out there, but I'd have to say I've been very, very fortunate that everybody that I've worked with the past 17 years has been nothing but great on the fact that we're treated as equals. That's good. And what's the process of becoming a captain? 
timing. It's it's all about a seniority list. So you get hired in and you get get a seniority number. And then as people retire, the, the, the seats will open up. And if you would like to take on that position, you can. So you just kind of move as people come and go. For me, it took 12 years for me to get into what we call the left seat the captain's seat. So I sat as a first officer. We're trained exactly the same. It's just, you got to have a ranking. Somebody has to be the boss for the, in the event of emergency, when it's all said and done, somebody have the final say. So you can't have two captains sitting up there because you might not ever come up with a conclusion. Basically, it's a military ranking and the first officer and the captain can both do the same job. It's just, you know, you got to put your time in before you can actually become the captain. And the one thing that a captain has over the first officer is final authority. When something is really out of sorts, that's when you stop and go, okay, I'm, I agree with everything everyone's saying, and this is my final decision on it. So it's just waiting for your turn. It took 12 years. There was a lot of stagnation in the industry. I had to wait 12 years with a reti- after the fall of the economy here in the U.S., one of our national unions and the FAA decided that they would allow, because so many people lost monies in their retirements, that we would not make the mandatory age of retirement HD, we would push it to 65. So when that went into play, people were staying until 65 years of age to get their retirement back on track. And that stagnated people leaving and retiring and us moving the, you know, the younger generation on the seniority of us moving into the left seat. So 12 years for me and it just became my turn. And so I, I jumped on it when the chance was there. And because I think for most of us, I don't want to use everybody because there's some people who would prefer the lifestyle of having a really fantastic schedule and stay a first officer. But for most of us, the goal when you become an airline pilot is to become an airline captain. Yeah, I was I was rather excited about it. And I was like, yes, I'm going to be a captain. This is going to be the coolest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> is there much of a pay difference? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. There is. Yeah. yeah. And when you were, is it first mate? Is that what you called it? First officer. First officer. When you but were, you can call it a first mate. I don't <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> it must be an Aussie thing. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> when you were first officer, did you ever have any situations where you felt like you were overruled, but you were right? Did you ever have that situation? Oh yeah, there there are those times. Very rarely, but every once in a while, you would get a stubborn person. I, I, you would get a stubborn captain. With those situations, if it's not going to jeopardize safety of flight, you can to keep what we call the brick wall. You don't want to build a wall in between the two people that need to work together for safety of flight. So we always call it when somebody started acting up or getting on your nerves, that was the first layer of bricks. And then if they didn't stop, then second layer. And then finally, you'd have this this wall built in between you where you di- would, didn't even want to talk to the person, which is not a good, it's just not good to have that kind of camaraderie up there. You know, you want it to be good. You want to work together. I mean, we're usually strangers. A lot of times you don't even know who you're flying with. When when you show up to work, it's somebody you've never met before, but you have this 99% trust in that person. And you're in this little intimate scenario of a cockpit where it's just the two of you for hours. And so you have to trust this person that they trust you, that they know what they're doing, that they keep up with their studying and all of this kind of stuff. And even if you have differences, you just don't bring those out. But yes, I've, I've felt that I've been right where uh, when I was a first officer and the captain's been wrong. Nothing that's ever been so out of sorts that it was safety related, but we've talked about it. Those are what we call, we call those our debriefings. And I stand my ground and I don't, you have to take a deep breath because you do go, okay, I am a female in the right seat. So I'm the second in command and I have to you know, put on my big girl pants and I have to go in and I have to confront the captain and tell him that I really think that was a, a wrong decision. And I didn't like that. You didn't l- listen to my suggestions for this scenario. And most of the time, the resolution comes out good because the captain will go, oh my gosh, I never realized, I should have listened to you. I didn't think about it in that way. Or you were right, I was wrong. If if it does 
continue to escalate and the person doesn't want to listen to your debrief, then you go to the higher rankings. Like I would head off to what we call our chief pilot and I would tell them, hey, I have a professional standards issue now. This person is not being a good captain and they're not listening to the rest of the crew when they really should be. So, but it's rare. It, again, it is very, very rare that you run into those situations because it is a pretty professional group. I'll tell you what, everybody wants to be the best that they can be at it. And they want everyone to be safe and feel comfortable coming into an airplane. You are flying, you know, 40,000 feet across water, right? Yeah. So it's, um, yeah. And all the people in the back that are sitting in those chairs have no idea what's happening in the front. We're putting oh, they have our no full faith in you guys. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny you say that because occasionally we will get that very nervous flyer. And as a cat, even when I was a first officer, when the flight attendants would say, we have a very nervous flyer in the back, I would get out of my seat. Of course, we had to do all this before takeoff because from 9-11, the doors, at least for the our domestic carriers here in the U.S., we have to have the doors shut once we, we push back from the gate and until we are break set at the gate again and taxi and so we can't get up and wander around the airplane and talk to passengers when we're airborne but when I would find out there was a nervous flyer before we take off I will go back and talk to him about it have him come up to the cockpit take a look around introduce myself and the captain or at this point now myself and my first officer and get that person comfortable with who we are up front make announcements let them know everything is is normal and fine and yeah because everybody in the back they do I mean I sit in the back going, boy, I wonder who's up there today. Like, you know, I'm like, because here I am sitting in the back and I can totally fly this airplane, but I'm trusting the two people that are up there right now are getting along and everything is copacetic and everybody's rested and hydrated and ready to go. And it, 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 <laughs> and, and it is do very you feel, interesting. Do you feel nervous when you're not flying? <laughs> No, not at all. It is. It's really interesting because I know when uh, I know that when I hop in an airplane, those two people up front are trained the same way I am. So I have so much confidence in their ability. So it it is interesting. I'd have to say there are there are some people though that I go, hmm, I don't know about that person. But you know, that's just kind of personality conflict. No, everybody's trained. Everybody wants to go home to their family at night. So I really don't. Like I said, I. With our airline, we've been very, very fortunate with everybody being good people and super professional for the most part and, and not having issues that you hear. People are human and they run into weird circumstances at home and it causes a lot of stress. And, you know, this is a high stress job, but I think as pilots, we don't consider it to be because it's what we do. No, I don't ever, you know, to answer your question, no, I don't get nervous when I'm in the back at all. <laughs> Although I will say, so my husband is a, an airline pilot as well. And now that the generation coming up under us that, that are training, they're all getting hired really young. I was in my 30s when I got hired. So is he, which is pretty much the norm. But the new kids that are coming through, they don't have to have college degrees anymore. So they're getting their ratings and coming in and flying airplanes with us at 23 years old. And I'm always like, boy, I don't know if they have enough experience. When I was 23, I was still figuring it out. And here, here these kids are coming in and flying people all over. And so every once in a while, I'm like, I hope they know what they're doing. Yeah, that, <laughs> because, that makes it a little bit scary. <laughs> yeah, that part. But when I hop into the big airlines, I have no no doubts in my mind. Everybody's super experienced. So some of the smaller, the little smaller regional air carriers, I always question, but I go, nope, they, they made it through sim training. They're going to do great. You know, I just yeah. hope that they can make the decisions as, as quickly as you want them to. But I also go, yeah, when I was 23, I was also invincible as well. So I do have confidence that ignorance is bliss, right? And <laughs> what yeah. they don't know is keeps everybody, you know, safe. So so you are only a local pilot. You don't want to go international? So the company I work for, we do international. We're just, it's a slow, you know, we're small. We're a much smaller airline. So we do... All of the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, we go into Canada, we go into Mexico, and we do go down into Central America now. So we're branching out. The, the company that I work for is the one company, if I was going to fly people, this was the only company I wanted to work for. And then otherwise, I was going to go and continue my cargo experience and work for a cargo company and fly all over the place. 
I love what I do because I get to be home a lot more than I, I guess. I, you know, it's, it's, the grass is always greener, right? I look at some of the, what we call the wide body aircraft or the heavies, you know, the 747s and the seven triple sevens and all those. And those folks going and flying across the Atlantic and coming out and visiting you in mm -hmm. Australia and whatnot. And I do envy that a little bit because they do get to travel and experience it without having to figure anything out. You know, when we get to an airport, some a company picks us up and takes us to a hotel that's already set up. And then you have, you know, 24 or 48 hours or 72 hours to go explore, come back to the hotel, get a ride, and then you you always have a seat in the airplane to go home. And it's kind of all set up for you in that way on the travel side of it. So yes, I'm a little envious, but at the same time, I really love what I'm doing here domestically as well. And eventually I will branch off and get myself overseas and, and do a little more traveling on my own. But this is this works out really, really well for me. There's people who want the international life and then there's people who don't. And it's not that I don't want it. This has just been really good to me so far. Okay. Have you had any issues while you've been flying, like any emergencies where you've thought, oh, this is this is like the diciest thing I've ever been in. Have you had any of those situations? I think the people in the back of the airplane and more on the flight attendant side would say that these are, you know, oh, that was like, you know, that was a really dicey, oh my gosh, we felt it in the back and how we are trained so proficient for the craziest scenarios and emergencies to come up that you are just so focused on getting the airplane on the ground and into the gate and getting everybody off of it that you don't really think about how bad it might have been or how bad it was. I'll use an example. I was flying into Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland, and it was a terrible winter storm. And the turbulence was probably some of the worst turbulence I've ever been in since I I started flying. You know, the first officer was what we call the pilot flying and I was the pilot monitoring. I was just looking at all this going, I, I kept thinking to myself, maybe we should just get out of here and go someplace else. But you keep going because you know the airplane isn't going to break in half. They're made to withstand what we were going through. First officer was doing a great job. Other people were following us and we were following them. So, so you get these things where you you're just taking deep breaths going, this is just, this is silly. It's never scary. And I guess one thing that I've told my family and friends that have asked, have you ever been scared? And I said, no, because the day that you're scared is probably the day that you should quit doing what you're doing. Because that's when you can start making mistakes when you get scared, right? You want to go hide under the bed and hope that the big monster goes away. So I can't say that I've ever been in anything that's been terrifying to me. I've been in situations that I can say that's uncomfortable, but it's not anything I can't handle. Have you hit a bird? Oh, yeah. Oh, does that happen a lot? You know, it happens more than people would think. Oh. The birds like to hang out at airports. I tell you what, you would think this would make me not fly an airplane ever again. So I'm going to tell you about my one bird story. It, it's it's interesting. I was 19 years old. I purchased five flying lessons at the university I was going to in Michigan. And the airport that the school was on, there was a lake out there. And so when you're learning to fly, we have what's called an ATIS. And that's just a, a term for airport information for the pilots. And that's going to let you know what the winds are doing, what the cloud layers are at, what runways are in use, frequencies to use. So you listen, it's all automated and they talk very, very fast. And I'll never forget my instructor saying, try and get the ATIS today. So I started writing everything down on a piece of paper. I didn't understand what the notice to airmen was, so I just kind of skipped over that. And we went up flying, and we hit a Canadian goose, one, and it destroyed the airplane. And the instructor had to take over. It hit the windshield, broke the windshield, bent the mm -hmm. propeller, and hit what we call the leading edge of the Cessna 152. The bird was almost as big as our airplane. My instructor was a hero, and he turned the airplane around when he basically limped it back to the airport, and we made it. Of course, they had to, we couldn't taxi the aircraft in, so, you know, we declared our emergency, and then they they towed us back in, and I, my legs were shaking. I called it my Elvis leg. You know, I felt like Elvis Presley up on stage dancing. My legs were shaking so hard. I couldn't believe we made it back in. So, but of course I was not, I was still learning. I didn't even know how to, to really do anything in an airplane. 
And I'll never forget my instructor saying to me a couple days later, we back in and we were talking, they were making sure that, you know, I was okay because it was a very scary situation. And I said, yes, I, I learned something from that whole thing. I learned what waterfowl in the vicinity of the airport is. Those are birds, waterfowl. I didn't know what that meant. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it was so funny because it, it was really fast. It said, notice to airmen, waterfowl in the vicinity of the airport, use caution. And I was like, I don't even know what that means. What? And I went, waterfowl, water birds, birds, birds. That was my first bird experience. It was crazy that propellers hanging up in the hangar at the university still to this day. I have to thank that flight instructor. He was fantastic. He's currently working for an airline here in the United States as well. And so I get to keep in touch with him every once in a while. I've probably hit four or five birds in my entire career. Okay. You know, I've hit a rabbit. A rabbit? See that? <laughs> yeah, it was actually on the runway and we, we landed and the rabbit hopped right in front of us and hit our airplane. It hopped up and hit the Boeing landing. I think it was in Denver. You get weird things. You know, we'd run over iguanas on runways oh. and some things you just can't avoid. Yeah. And you probably can't even see them, can you, until you get close? Oh, yeah. You can't see it until it's like right there in front of you. And you're like, oh, well, it's kind of like a squirrel running across the street. You're like, oh, darn it. Mm. <laughs> you know, you feel bad, but what are you going to do? I haven't had any significant bird strikes that have caused any major damage to an aircraft. Now, there's a question I have that I forgot to ask Jay about. So I'm going to ask you, Jay was okay. my flight attendant. Can people travel with pets in the U.S.? Yes. I have to take a deep breath and sigh. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And it's my opinion. It's gotten a little out of control here in the U.S. And it's all because people do not want to pay money. So they fly with their dogs, their cats, right? Yes. And it's it got a little out of control where people were carrying monkeys. <gasps> yeah, weird animals. Weird animals would come, you know, they want to bring goats on board. They want my emotional support kangaroo. So probably for the past five to seven years, animals have gotten a little out of control. People will use emotional support animal so they don't have to pay 75 to to $100 for their animal, animal to be caged to go down into the cargo hold pressurized warm cargo hold where large animals belong because there's just no room on the airplane for them. But when people found out that they could use emotional support, so a service animal is allowed on board because that animal is serving a purpose for a handicapped human being, right? Yes. If somebody is blind, if somebody cannot hear, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So those animals are allowed on board for that purpose. But the emotional support just became out of control because if people would bring their, their Rottweiler on board an airplane and call it an emotional support animal. And the Rottweiler is pulling them around. And I'm like, where's the emotional support with that? You know, I said, you're just trying to sneak through the system and get your animal on board for free instead of paying $75 and putting it in a cage and whatnot. I mean, you should hear the, the stories we, we hear on the news about somebody brought their snake on board <gasps> and their snake had an emotional support cat. And, you know, I mean, it just is, it's comical and it makes you laugh because you can't make any of it up. I mean, people do this for real. So they do. I remember being on an, on a plane yeah. in the U S and I could hear this meow. Oh yeah. Meow. Meow. I'm yes. Like, what is that? Am I going crazy? Am I hearing is a cat? Is that a baby or is that a cat? It was yeah. a cat and there was a cat and it meowed the whole way. Oh, yeah. They don't want to be on board that airplane, right? Cats do not like anything like that. And, and some dogs are too big. So the rules have changed again domestically. And the airlines now say if you're going to bring an animal on board, it has to be in a cage and the cage has to fit under the seat in front of you. So you know how you can put your little duffel bag or your purse yeah. or whatever where your feet go. So if the animal is in a cage and it fits under that seat, you can bring that animal on board and it can only be a dog or a cat. We can't have all these weird exotic animals on board mm. airplanes. I yeah. mean, it was, it just gets out of control yeah. and it's weird and they make noises and they 
go to the bathroom and it smells, people are allergic and it just, it's, it's, it's a slippery slope for sure. You <laughs> yeah. know, when it comes to I don't, that. I don't know what the rule is in Australia, but I don't think I've ever come across a cat on a plane in Australia so far. And I've taken a lot of flights, but in the U S I definitely came across a lot of animals and I thought it was quite bizarre. <laughs> Yes, it is very interesting. Some of the things that we let go over here in the U.S., I tell you what. So I know that the one of the other rules that the carriers came up with that the U.S. carriers, if the flight is over five hours, your animal has to go down in the cargo hold. So if you're going to fly from San Francisco to Tokyo, your animal, if you're going to bring your animal with you, it has to be, you have to check it as luggage. You have to pay and check your animal as luggage. They're not going to allow you to have it in the cabin like they used to in Australia I'm not sure if you're aware there are very strict rules about animals and I don't know if you heard about the Johnny Depp situation how he tried to bring his dogs in and he didn't do it through the correct way and he was taken to court because of it we very oh, no. serious here in Australia yeah he brought them on his plane and it's just not acceptable they can't they won't do it that way they have to go into quarantine they have to go through quarantine standards and checks and all of this kind of stuff here in Australia well, good for you guys. I'm an animal lover. I, I, I love every every pet out there, but I just think there's a time and a place. I don't think your animals should be walking through malls, and I don't think animals should be sitting in airplanes next to me, and I don't think that they should be sitting at a dinner table at a restaurant next to me, you know, that kind of thing. I just think you're, there's a time and a place for your animal. So I kudos you Australians for having those rules over there, and I hope Johnny Depp learned his lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone then knew the rules because I wasn't that aware of it, to be honest with you, until I knew that we're very strict with a lot of things here and what you can and can't bring into Australia. We've got a very, very strict customs area. I knew that you can't bring in live plants or you can't bring in any wood. You can't bring in anything like that to Australia. So I'm aware of that. But that making the news made it very known to everybody that that's not allowed. And they made oh, wow. a really big stand on it. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. No, I didn't hear that, but I'll have to look it up. I love those kind of stories. Those are always fun to read. <laughs> <laughs> so where is your favorite place to fly into? It's so much easier to answer the question, what is your least favorite place to fly into? Because so many places are amazing. I'm going to say it was, it's Chicago. I love the city of Chicago. I think it's fantastic. I love flying into that airport. There's a lot of traffic. The controllers are really, really good. I will say any place that's tropical, like going into Mexico and flying into those airports are always just fantastic because they're beautiful. The scenery flying in, the blue waters, the, you know, the hills and all that kind of stuff. Jay mentioned Alaska. He said he loved flying into Alaska and coming into the cockpit and checking out the Northern Lights? Oh, yeah. So I can tell you, I lived up in Alaska. I just currently moved down to Los Angeles a year ago on a beautiful day. Let's just call it a beautiful summer day or even a beautiful winter day when there are clouds in the sky and there's no wind. It is one of the most beautiful places to fly around and fly into. The airports are tucked into little cove areas of mountain ranges on little islands and there are you know whales popping out and there's snow-capped mm -hmm. mountains and absolutely beautiful and incredible now as a pilot when the weather deteriorates it's not a fun place to fly it's very very turbulent it's very demanding it's very challenging icy runways they're small and short but i'll tell you what some of the most beautiful flying on a on a crystal clear non-windy day that place we're taking Boeing 737s into places I've never, I can't even explain. It is, so I'm with Jan at the Northern Lights, phenomenal. That's one of my favorite things. And I'm just going to kind of branch off here for a second because I'm, I'm glad he mentioned that. One of my favorite things to do is when we're doing our bathroom break, we always have to have a flight attendant come up into the cockpit. So there's two persons in the flight deck at all times. It's always great to let the flight attendants trade off when there's some beautiful phenomena up in the uh, Arctic Circle going on a moon or watching this side of the airplane, the, the moon is setting. And on this side of the airplane, the sun is rising because you're so far north. Oh my gosh. I can't even imagine what that would look like. 
It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And you know what? I can send you some pictures. I have some gorgeous pictures from the flight deck with that phenomena happening and, and the northern lights and all that. So I, I can, just did um, a happy dance. I did a happy dance. I can't wait to see those images. I will post them on my Instagram page so everyone can see them. I can't wait to see them. It's really cool. So I'm glad Jay mentioned that because that is one of the beautiful things about some of the places we do fly into. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's phenomenal. Okay, going back on to what you just mentioned before was which is the place that you least like flying into? Oh, I I really don't like flying into San Francisco, California. Oh, really? <laughs> It is some of the busiest airspace. You know, the East Coast is is very busy as well. But I'll tell you what, I would rather fly into up. I'd rather go to the North Slope of Alaska on a cruddy day and and challenge my abilities and and land on these 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 little teeny tiny runways. You know, with whiteouts than I would coming into San Francisco on a clear day. It is crowded. It's busy. The controllers get stressed out ground operates. There's just so much traffic in San Francisco. It is just, I can't even begin to tell you it's constantly like being on a Los Angeles freeway. So it is one of my LAX places. isn't as bad as that one? No, no. Isn't that incredible? It is incredible. Oh, it is. I would have thought LAX would have been the busiest and the most chaotic. You would think so. Some of the busiest airports in the world are actually organized so well that they can get the traffic in and out without a problem. The controllers are great. Uh, but when it comes for some reason, you know, San Francisco is just one of those places that you just, whenever I think about, oh my gosh, I have to fly there, I just bite my tongue because I go, we are going to be delayed. We're going to be, what should be a an hour flight is going to be an hour and 40 minutes because San Francisco is just going to be... Oh, oversaturated with buffoonery, you know, so it's funny because it's not that the city that I don't, once you get on the ground, it's fine, but I'll yeah. tell you what, that's just one of my least favorite places to fly into. Having flown for a smaller airline before I, I got hired with the, the major carrier, some of the other places I didn't, as a pilot, I didn't like flying into were, was mountainous train in the winter time, because it's just really hard to get in and out with with the weather and the snow and the visibilities. And so it just makes it very, very challenging. But yeah, San Francisco, I'd have to say, is my, me personally, my least favorite place to fly into. Mm. It's just a pain in the, pain in the butt. So you mentioned your husband before, and is he a captain as well? Yes, he is. Uh -huh. Okay. He's so a captain. Yeah. before you became a captain, did you ever fly together? We did. Not very often, but we did. It was... Before or after you were married? <laughs> This was before. It was before. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, it was before, but we were, you know, we met 17 years ago. We got to fly together. It was always great. And I'll tell you what, I wish there would have been opportunities to fly as, you know, as a married team, because I still think we would have fun doing it. But, you know, I talked to, the, I know other couples that have flown together and, and, and they say it's great. So do they see, I've got this image of you didn't take the rubbish out. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. But, <laughs> but you know what? It's funny because you would, you would think it would be like listening to a couple driving in a car, right? You know, cause mm -hmm. they're always, there's always the, what person not driving in the, in the couple relationship is the backseat driver and you're not doing it right. And you need to turn here and you need to slow down and watch out for this. And, but when we're up there, we take on the role. You don't, you're not husband and wife anymore. You're captain and first officer or vice versa. And so you're just, you're doing your job very specifically. So uh, that's kind of fun. Now, since we've been married, we, we get to jump seat a lot. So we've been in the jump seats together when the other person's flying but you just what's a jump seat so a jump seat there are extra seats up in the cockpit for FAA examiners for instructors for pilots when there's no seats available in the back we have the privilege with having our license and everything on us and our company badges to fly in the jump seat of any airline we want so we could always sit in the front if we so desire and it's space available up there so there's like the aircraft i fly fly boeing 737s and there are two jump seats and they're just two little extra seats that fold out of the wall and you can oh. sit in those up there and so you can go to whatever whatever de destination you want to sitting there without actually having to fly the plane yep absolutely oh. Yeah. 
just have to have your credentials and all that on you. And that's all it takes. So a lot of times we do that when we try and do the, what we call our um, non-rev travel, which is space available, standby. And if all the seats fill in the back of the airplane, we have the option and flight attendants have the same option, not for the cockpit, but they can sit in their company jump seats, which is where the flight attendants sit during you know, the takeoffs and landings. Okay. So next time I go, I can pretend to be a pilot and say, can I sit in you the jump try. seat and they're see if they let me? Gonna, <laughs> yeah. You're, they're probably going to figure it out. But you know, I always say it, you can't, it can't hurt to try, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to throw out some of those big words you said earlier with flying and I'll talk about the, the, the birds flying through. I know that there's none of them today and yep, I just start flying. Right. <laughs> yes, 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 absolutely. You can show me some pictures from the cockpit, right? And go, hey, look, and I've got these pictures. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Let me sit in a jump seat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. I didn't even know that was a thing. That's great. What are the best perks you love about your job? I'd have to say I get paid to fly to the destination and then the destination is is there to explore. And, and let me see if I can explain this better. That I think that's my the, the best perk is I don't have to, like, like I had mentioned before, I don't have to set anything up. When I do a trip, for example, the next trip that I'm going to do, I'm going to fly from Los Angeles to Seattle to San Diego. And then I'm going to lay over in San Diego and there is going to be a a car there to pick us up after we land. So we don't have to worry about how we're going to get to the hotel. We don't have to worry about the hotel because it's already been booked and our rooms are ready for us. We don't have to stand in line with all the other people waiting to check in. We have a separate area and then we head off to our room. And then if you have time and you're not too tired, you can go out and explore that city. And then the next, you know, the next day I'm going to head to Maui so that I can explore San Diego that evening and go find a neat restaurant or a coffee shop and then go back to the hotel and, and sleep and then get up the next day and I'm going to, I'm going to work my way to Maui. And when I land in Maui, that same scenario is going to happen. Someone's going to come pick us up. They're going to take us to the hotel. The hotel is going to be on the beach. We're going to check in and then I can go put on my bathing suit and I can go paddle boarding. I can go sit in the sun. I can take a nap. You get to go to all these really neat places and you don't have to plan the trip. The trip is already planned for you. So I think to me, that's the greatest perk. Now there's something to be said about planning a vacation, right? But you have to you have to plan it where yeah. this is all planned for you. Mm -hmm. And I will say the flight attendants, I don't know if Jay men mentioned this when, when you had your chat with him, the flight attendants are the savviest travelers I've ever met in my entire life. And they always go, so we're all going to meet at, you know, this time down in the lobby and we're going to go to this really cool restaurant that I have a friend who, they all, they have friends everywhere too, flight attendants. I just, I love them to death because they know all the greatest places to go in every city we go to. So they're like our little tour guides on top of it. So that's another big perk about my job is flight attendants are travel savvy and I just love them for it because I don't have to do anything except show up and get paid. So. That's fabulous. So for all those women out there that are thinking about a career in it, what do you tell them? Do it. It's amazing. I, I say go for the pilot side of it. It's it's very self-satisfying to do something that 80% of the world cannot do and that's fly an airplane. So I say do it. It's phenomenal. The money is phenomenal. The travel's great. But if you don't think that you like to be in control of a big piece of machinery, flight attendant is another great option. The money isn't as great, but the benefits are all right there as well. I say go for it. Hmm. I think the airline industry is a really, uh, I'm so fortunate that I branched off into it. I can't imagine doing anything else. I can't imagine sitting at a desk and playing with a computer all day. I think that would just drive me bananas. <laughs> <laughs> We are approaching our destination. Ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts for the final five. All right, your favorite city or town in the world? I'm going to say there, my favorite town is going to be Talkeetna, Alaska. It's a little teeny tiny village that really only is open during the summertime and it's right off the train tracks. It's halfway in between Denali and Anchorage. It's just a fun little artsy you know, a half a mile main street and that's all that's there. And it is just music and art and rivers and hiking and the people. It's just cute little fun town. So I'd say that's my favorite town. And again, my favorite city, which I mentioned before, is Chicago, okay. that I love Chicago. I love the people. 
the weather, the rivers, the buildings, the architecture, the food, the music. I just, I love blues and, and jazz. And so Chicago is just one of my favorite places. Yeah, I love Chicago too. I have not been to Alaska, but after speaking to you and Jay, it makes me really want to go there. <laughs> oh, you need to go. And if you have any questions about it, give me a call. I've lived up there. My husband lived up there as well. So the weirdest food you've ever eaten? Salmon eggs. When we go fishing up in the state of Alaska, uh, one of the things that we do when, when we're um, filleting the fish is you either give, you know, you can use the salmon eggs for fishing. Um, you can throw them back in. I know I have some friends from Russia and they make vodka with the fish eggs, um, but I've tried some raw salmon eggs. It was the weirdest and grossest thing I've ever eaten in my life. It sounds it's pretty gross. Disgusting. <laughs> It is pull it right out of the fish and try it. And I tell you what, not, I'm, I've done it once and it was weird and, and I'm good. I can say, I can check that one off my list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Beaches or mountains. All right. So this is how I'm going to answer this. If I feel like gaining 10 pounds, the beaches, if I'm going to go on vacation, because I look at a beach and go, I'm just going to go and relax and I'm not going to really try and exercise and I'm going to go out on a sailboat and I'm just going to be a total lounge gal. My Mai Tai and my sailboat and, and you know, some flip-flops. The mountains are probably going to beat out the beaches for me because I love the diversity in the weather. You know, you can be at the base of a mountain and it can be really warm and then, you, you know, you hike up a couple thousand feet and it's all cool and there's Snow. different, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's just all of it. So, that's a tough one, but I, I'd have probably say mountains because I, I like the, the activity that you get from the mountains. Okay. Your favorite tourist destination or site that you've seen that you think everyone would want to see? Well, I think that everybody should see Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Um, <gasps> really? You know, I have yes. nearly... Have you seen that? No, I had so many road trips planned to go there. And for some reason, they kept getting directed to different places and we didn't end up going. But it's been on my list so many times to the point that it was the day and we're like, we're going to go there today. And then it changed and we're like, all right, no, we're going to San Antonio or wherever we ended up going. So we didn't end up going there. But oh, that's interesting. It's beautiful. The Black Hills are amazing. I went a long time ago, back when I was in college, and I need to go again as a middle-aged adult. It's And I know there's so many of these incredible places around, and you just go, how in the world did people do this? I mean, look at our technology today. So I'm just going to say Mount Rushmore is amazing. It, it took almost 20 years for that to be carved into the side of the rocks. And it is, I look at that and go, how do they do that? Those were just people with chisels, you know, that wasn't the technology and lasers or anything like we have today. So, and, and of course, it just Keystone is just gorgeous, phenomenal, but it's breathtaking. So that's what I say people need to go see. It's oh, really interesting. Really, I've really been neat. so close because I, I obviously spend a lot of time in Iowa. So it is not a very long drive to get there, but yeah, it, like I said, many times I'm meant to be going there, but now I will. Next time I go back, it will be on my list because of your recommendation. Perfect. Perfect. I like that. Let me know what you think. And for the final one, can you say thank you in another language? Oh, I can. Good on you, Michelle, for inviting me to this program. Is that how you say thank you in Australian? No. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> I know it's not another language, but I'm going to come up with some Australian slang and I'm going to give it to her. Good on you. <laughs> See, we would probably say good on you. Like, yeah, at the end. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, good on you. Okay, well, thank you. I will I will correct that. Uh, the only two languages, and I'm not good at either of them, of course, gracias, because mm -hmm. I'm here in Southern California, and merci beaucoup. Those are my two uh, thank yous plus my Australian slang. Good on you. Good on you. Good, good on, on you, mate. I don't, you got, I, you got to chuck a mate in there. Mate. Good on you, mate. Yeah, good on you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure talking to you and learning all about being in a cockpit and how exciting it sounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, if you ever have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me. I love that you're doing this whole podcast thing. Thanks for having me. It's been wonderful. Good on you, mate. Good on you, mate. <laughs> Thanks for listening to With You Every Step, hosted by Michelle Lee. We do hope you enjoyed listening. And if you did, make sure you tell everybody. If you didn't, 
nobody likes a Debbie Downer. Please subscribe to get up to date with our latest releases and give us a thumbs up on our social media at With You Every Step. We love to hear from you. If you have any questions or inquiries, head to the Contact Us page at our website, michellelee.com. That's also where you'll find all our blogs mentioned in the podcast. We love to hear from you and if we have inspired you to travel. Thanks for listening. Love life and adventure on.